Thanks, y'all, for coming. Uh, I'm Stephen Dusner. I wrote a book about these guys. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've been writing about them since 2004. I've covered out for Pitchfork, Washington Post, Washington Post Express, um, Spin, Village Voice, and uh, culminating in a book. And I'm done. I'm never <laughs> and I'm fed, yeah. So, um, and I'm, I'm very fortunate because even now I still listen to their stuff. It still moves me the way it always has. And, and I feel very fortunate because they're just also really good guys. And uh, the whole band. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so, yeah I'm, I'm going to just kind of ask them a couple of questions and also maybe open it up. But I was wondering, I mean, this book is, which I have in front of me, but is, um, oh yeah, is, uh, it's about place as much as anything else, and, and some of the places that, no, I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, okay, all right, I'll take it. Some of the places y'all have written about, and some of the places y'all have lived, and haven't lived, and I wondered, um, you know, it's, Athens is in here, Birmingham, Memphis, Mangere County, which is my hometown. Uh, but I wondered if there were places that weren't in here that y'all, that are important to you, that are that are sort of, that, that you think about in relationship to what you created. Um, I mean, is New York in it? No. I put New York in it, maybe. Yeah. I mean, New York was a big deal to us, because we, you know, we grew up in the South. It's like, ah, someday I want to play, I want my band to play in New York. And uh, we, uh, you know, we had, this is our fourth band together, because uh, Cooley and I had three bands before Drive-By Truckers, and none of them ever went as far as North Carolina, much less New York. And, one, of them, uh, one of them had a much better name. <laughs> <laughs> they know. I think all three of them had a better name. <laughs> That's a whole nother story, but uh, yeah, it's like it's like playing New York was a big deal, and uh, uh, and we did it early. And you know, the, the cliche about playing New York is, you know, like when you see the last waltz, they talk about the first time they played New York. It's like, all right, you know, Levon's voice, you go to New York and you get your ass beat, and then you <laughs> try it again, and sooner or later, one day, it's just okay. But we we broke the cliche. We had like our first time there was kind of awesome, and. And every single time we ever played New York, except for one, was truly awesome. We had these amazing nights there, really early in our story, and uh, and we're like, God, we're gonna be, we're, this is gonna work. We can play New York, and the big city, and people come out and they like us. It's awesome, and everything. And um, the one exception was like probably the tenth time we played there, we played CBGBs for the one and only time. And uh, it was every cliche about playing CBGBs. There was like nobody there. We got cheated on the deal. And while we were playing, someone broke into our van and stole whatever was in the van, which wasn't gear, because we were on stage. They just stole like our clothes and suitcases, and, and they stole my backpack, which they had mine. <laughs> they, not yours. they stole my backpack, which had all the songs I had written for the next record or actually the record after next, which would have been the record now known as Decoration Day. So basically all the heathen songs got stolen. And, uh, and I was, you know, understandably very upset about it. But it being New York and the way our relationship with that city went, about three weeks later, someone tracked down my phone number and called me and it was somebody who found my notebooks on the sidewalk in New York City. And they somehow found my phone number in one of those notebooks and called me and said they've got them for me. And the next time we played New York, which was at Brownies, which is rural, uh, the guy came and gave me back all my notebooks with all those songs. Whoever stole my backpack opened it up a few blocks away and goes, ah, what's this shit? Threw it down, <laughs> kept the backpack. And so I got so therefore Decoration Day album did happen. <laughs> so thank you, New York City. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, 
and y'all were there right right after right after 9/11. So. Yeah, yeah, we were. We, we played there. I think it was like October 11th or 12th or something like that. And uh, where we were staying, I mean, you could still see the smoke rising and stuff. It was awful. And we did a benefit for a, a, a fireman who was a regular at a bar that my ex-wife was running at the time and so she put together a benefit the night before our show when we played that but uh yeah i mean and and ironically we almost were in town when 9 11 happened because we actually got asked to play uh what's that thing called the college music cmj cmj we got asked to play cmg cmj but our about to come out record we didn't know for sure we'd have them yet in time to play it which was Southern Rock Opera, so we passed on doing that, or else we probably would have been in town on that actual date. So, yeah. you know, again, we kind of got lucky, I guess, with New York. But, yeah. uh, well, and, and thinking about this tour as well, and this is one of the first about Wes Freed, who I'm sure y'all know who Wes Freed is, and, and I am in his debt forever because he literally gave me the image to use on the cover of the book, but not exactly. Seems like the way he was. Yeah. And, um, so I wondered about that, especially with this new song about this new song on the top. Talk about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to talk. I'll blab.
but it, it just wasn't. So, <laughs> yeah. you're not always able to do it, you know. You, it, it's, it's, it's not always something you, you can't always find the way to say it and the thing you want to say about that person. Uh, yeah. there, there have been quite a few that deserved it, but you just can't find a way to do it sometimes. Yeah, Grand Canyon, you know, is special to me because it's so celebratory, even though, you know, we were broken hearted when we wrote it. We wrote it about uh, Craig Liskey, who was our merch guy for, God, seven years, but he was also like one of my closest friends for like 20 years. And, uh, and uh, you know, and so when we play that song, it's kind of a way of still having him with us. And, you know, we've kind of incorporated other people we've lost into that song in, in hopefully a, a more celebratory way. And, uh, you know, when I was writing uh, the Ballad of Cecil Macabre, I, for several months I was trying to write a song that to me somehow captured him, and I was just getting more and more frustrated. And then I had this epiphany, it's like, I'm going about this all wrong, I just need to write something that I think he would like. And then it became easy, and I actually then wrote the song really quickly after beating my head against it for several months. And uh, you know, because at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, he would like this. And the fact that he's in it, or he'd like that even better. You know, he definitely like, he would definitely like that part. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine trying to capture something like that in the moment, like when it's still alive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I started writing songs as a kid. It's my way of dealing with the bullshit that I didn't know other way to how to deal with. So I started writing really young, and that was just my way of dealing with it. So. You know, I guess that's, you know, if I have a knack for writing <laughs> sad songs, that's probably, probably why. But uh, uh, but that one was really a struggle because it was just, I mean, I, the, you know, loss of Wes has hit me on so many levels in addition to the obvious, you know, losing a, a one of my best friends of 25 years. There's all these other levels to it too because he's so tied in with what we do creatively and our band and our band's identity and all that. And I feel like, you know, it's like maybe now's the time that we change the name of the band to go and pile driver and, and, and move forward. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe this close is that chap, that 25 year chap. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I do think of that, like uh, you, you mentioned Grand Canyon, and that's one that means a lot to me personally. It's because when you are like telling everybody to raise a glass, I'm thinking about people I've lost along the way, and I know that I've talked to fans who feel the same way. And I think, I don't know, I'm just I'm off the top of my head, that feels like when people say, go to the rock show, and it's like church, that's what makes me think of church. It's like remember, remembering these people that you've lost. So that almost ruins it for me. What church, without, what church without the guilt? The no guilt church. But they Craig was also in the crowd a lot too, and you got to know him, and so that, you know, as well, is another layer of like closeness with the fans, and then you love us. I mean, our fans mourned Craig yeah. like we did. I mean, he was. He, he had such a talent for getting to know people and, and remembering people that he met years. I mean, it's incredible what he, I can't even fathom that. I can't, I have trouble remembering yesterday. And he, he had such a, a gift for that. Like, oh, you're that guy that bought the big to-do from me on the third night of the tour. <laughs> How do you know that? Literally, here's that guy. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? Or? So I know I speak for everybody here. Let well, me thank you for all the music over the years. But more than your music, your fans, the Ian's from Top to Little Sarah and World Wide Bill, the community is just incredible. So of all the venues you've played over the years, not counting the 40 lot, we've got to take them out. What are your top three as far as what? What, do you, what did you guys enjoy playing the most? What are your top three? I bet we have the same one. Uh, Probably so. Uh, on the East Coast, it's the 930. Yes. Uh, in, the, in the middle, it's First Avenue. Uh, on the West Coast, it's the Philadelphia. 
Exactly. Right. <laughs> that, that's three for me. I don't know. Playing in Lexington in the Sleet Show last year was fantastic. Oh, it, was about, it was about this time last year. It was. And we, we froze and, and we all got kind of sick. Yeah. For like yes. a bit. Most of the rest of the tour. Yes. Yep. That was fun. <laughs> I've been living in England and I moved back and I stayed with my mom in Birmingham. And the day after I got back from England, my wife and I are walking around this lake next to my mom's house, and this guy jogs by and he's wearing a 930 club. Now, I've seen a lot of shows at the 930 club. I just love see. I love that place. And I watch him, he makes the round again jogging and he makes around the lake and he comes by and says, I like that shirt. He's like, Oh yeah, my band used to play there and he whips his hair out of his face and his mic. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true, I was jogging. <laughs> and no one was chasing. <laughs> Backcountry, and 
it was so depressing <laughs> and beautiful, everything all in one, you know, just the beautiful mountains, but also the jump. And, uh, and we listened to you the whole time. So <laughs> that, was, that was the beautiful part. So. Yeah. Like my granddaddy worked in Charleston when I was uh, about middle school age, and uh, my grandmother and I would drive up and visit him there. He worked, uh, he was a pipe fitter, and he, so he would work wherever they were building oil refineries, they would send him off to work. So he was always working these kind of godforsaken places and uh, uh, very industrial places. And uh, so we, we visited him two or three times in Charleston, one of which was uh, Thanksgiving weekend in 1977. And um, there was a concert in town, and it was at the Civic Center, uh, and for $3, ACDC, UFO, and the Motors. And I talked to my grandmother into taking me to that show. <laughs> and she sat in the car with a flashlight and a book and read a book while I was inside having my 13-year-old brain rocked out. And uh, it was like the first like real like kick-ass concert I ever saw. Like, like life-changing show. Bon Scott and all that. Michael Schenker was in UFO and I mean, great, three dollars, man. I'll take that Bruce Springsteen, three dollars. <laughs> what about you, what's the memorable first show? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what counts as a first one, really. I mean, I saw Carl Perkins in a small theater when I was, when I was a kid. So yeah, that's, that's up there. Did he do it? Yeah. Did he do a medley of his commercial jingles? Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, I got to hear the same form jingle. Yeah. <laughs> My first concert was Chicago, but it was the Terry Cath era. And uh, he was a shredded guitar player. He was Jimi Hendrix's favorite guitar player. I, I saw George Jones in a used car a lot. Once. We went to. Uh, we went to the, he, he played a gig at the, I think it was in the service department of a Chevy dealership. <laughs> so he didn't show that time, so the band had to just play a set without him. And then uh, a year or so later, he, he was at a, he was at a used car lot on Woodward Avenue in Muscle Shoals. And he actually showed up. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. I wasn't into it back then. Yeah. I don't think I would have been either, but I could have seen Yeah. I think that needs to be a song. <laughs> <laughs> there is a George Jones song. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Talking cell phone blues. Yeah. Uh, that's right. that's and right. We covered a George Jones song backing up Baby LaVette, too. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the songs on that record is one of his, it was like his, kind of his, I think it was even post car wreck, like one of those, when he was trying to sober up songs. Great song. Yeah, yeah it was a great song. And Betty sang the shit out of it, and he wrote her a note. He actually sent her a note how much he loved her, her song, her version of that one. Favorite colors? Oh. <laughs> Black. 
my heart.
about what a, a big fan of the truckers are for her personally. And it's really cool to listen to that album and hear the influence of these guys on a younger generation. And the, I mean, it's got the same sort of level of detail, specificity, but also the universality of it. That that is uh, um, it's, it's badass. You know, my, my kids are fans of Wednesday, so I, I got some cool points. <laughs> <laughs> what song did they cover of yours? And they covered Women Without Whiskey. That's right. And they, okay, yeah. they do like a kind of really suitcase yeah. version. It's cool. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's how I first heard about them was uh, uh, there's a, a music website called Aquarium Drunkard that I like a lot. And the owner of that, he was also the person who first turned me on to uh, Alabama Shakes, actually, when they were first starting. Uh, he he sent me a text when he first heard him with that whiskey, their version. He's like, have you heard this yet? And that's when I instantly became a fan. And y'all had a lot of like pretty badass openers, like Billy Hyatt and Alabama Shakes and Wednesday. Like, I feel like y'all, you're not just uh, touring with whoever's convenient or, or you're choosing them with a lot of, uh, you're, 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 you're making good choices there. Yeah, that's important. I mean, I think, I mean, to me, the opener is very important because it, it's, I mean, the people who come in, that's the first hour of the show. And so it's, it's set, get them in a mood, you know, that, that then we can, you know, hopefully build on or do something else with. But uh, uh, there's, there's nothing would suck worse than having like somebody suck for Take a lot of pride about about his yeah, I'd, I'd rather not have one at all. It's, oh, yeah. it's it, yeah, you, somebody that you know the crowd's going to like or maybe into if they get introduced. And, you know, There's always pressure from you know some of the local promoters. You know, it's like ticket sales are a little off. Can you put so and so in? almost never pans out. It's always so-and-so doesn't pull anybody that wouldn't have been there anyway, and they suck. <laughs> about, about one out of 50 times you get lucky and it's something cool, but it's almost always like some drinking buddies cousin <laughs> yeah. or a promoter, and it just sucks. We try our best not to do it. That, that happens occasionally. Well, and and that, that continues with Margaret Silker, who's opening for them. Yeah, it's fantastic. So if y'all if y'all are going on, I think you should get the girl here. She's yeah, she's badass. Does she have horns or brass or slash no. dealer? I just I heard some of that on the record. I just yeah, it's it's, it's it's stripped down. It's uh, okay. just two people, but they're really good, yeah. really good, and her songs are great. And and uh, the crowd's been liking it every night. It's, she's been doing really well with it. And tonight's your birthday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, it's almost like uh, Dave Rawlings and Jillian Welch. Uh, he's that kind of fluid guitar player. Yeah, really good. Yeah. I think he plays with John Moreland a lot too. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's really good. Yeah. What's the biggest surprise that you've ever had I mean, you know, sure, I guess. I mean, um, you know, I don't, I usually know what's coming, but not always. And, uh, well, a long time ago, there was Supergroup. Oh my God, that's a <laughs> yes. From New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> that was a Supergroup. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we weren't, we weren't like, you know, it was a long time ago, we were in Pensacola, and uh, <laughs> we used to have a lot of fun in Pensacola. <laughs> and uh, they, we, we, we kind of copped an attitude, you know, we didn't know they were going to put another band on the bill. We're like, oh, dude, another band. <laughs> how, long I, how long am I going to have to sit here and drink? <laughs> but, and they were phenomenal. I, I, I just, I walked up into the room and I was like, You got to see this shit. <laughs> Halloween show 
at the Nick at Birmingham. We were Alice Cooper. And yeah, we, we, we did, we were all like the different Alice Coopers, you know, from different eras. And, uh, it, the, but, so they decided they were going to do Motley Crue. <laughs> I mean, they, these guys are cock rock aficionados and very, very good at it. And uh, so the, they had Motley Crue makeup on. And at the Nick, it doesn't matter what time you're supposed to go on, it's going to be 2 a.m. Because <laughs> you know you you have your, your your band and whatever band you knew you were going to be doing the show with, plus whatever they added without telling you, and so it keeps getting pushed back and pushed back. You I mean, it, 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 yeah, I mean, you, going on at midnight is early, and for the first band. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. And uh, it, so at one point uh, we were. And I, at, at one point, they, 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 their makeup was running because we've been hanging out there for drinking so long. Uh, one of the, the guitar player was like up on the bar, going nuts. We do our show; it's like God, I'm probably going on five a.m. And uh, the Nick never closed. For, no, for the record, like the they, literally, they closed on Sunday from I think 7 a.m. till noon because of some kind of quirk in the Alabama law. Yeah, and they then they changed that, that and they quit having to do that. So they were 24-7. They, they got in their van out in the parking lot. I don't know how much, how, how, what this bar tab had to be if you were actually paid it. And somebody ran out and said, hey, hey, you guys still have a tab in here you haven't settled yet. And they leaned out the windows drunk. Motley crew making oh, up running down his face and goes, Super Group don't pay no bar to him. Uh, 
Why is it special to you? We get along. <laughs> really good. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, it's like there's, there's like, I mean, it's it's hard putting a band together. It's really hard having five people that can spend that amount of time cooped up together and not have at least one person that you want to kill at any given time or that wants to kill you. Just like and, a family. Yeah, it is. And, uh, it, you know, and so, so it, it really, it, you know, like I would have loved to have never had to have personnel changes because, you know, but because it sucks having to change. I, I don't really like that. But uh, it just, there was always somebody that just, it, wasn't working for them. I mean, the road's hard, and and you know, and obviously there's things along the way you do that don't make it easier to you know. And so uh, it just kind of it, 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 when it all of a sudden became just this lineup, which happened rather suddenly because we were uh, we were playing 930 Club for uh, the New Year's thing in uh, 2012, turning into 13, and uh, had a member basically. Uh, quit the day before the three night stand at 9:30. My sister saw it on Facebook and called me and told me, and uh, that's how we found out. And uh, um, it's true. And uh, and and so that's when Jay's like Jay been playing keyboards with us for a number of years, and we by that time we had Bobby Matt playing bass, and Jay's like, hey, you know. I mean, we could probably use a third guitar on so many songs. You need to learn a few of these songs on guitar. And I'm like, sure, that'd be great. And the first night with that, it was just like magical. It was like, oh my God, this is the fucking band. <laughs> and uh, and that's been the band ever since. That's cool to see all the fans really react to Bobby Matt and Jay and everybody. It's, 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 I mean, I, I, it's the first time recently that I've seen people well, I have the best seat in the house because I, I literally get to stand there and I, where I stand, I can hear everybody. And, uh, and I'm the only one in the band that doesn't have any ears. And so I really, I can stand in the middle of the stage and on the Almost any night, I can hear each person playing their parts, and I, I really love that. And, uh, so I, I, I consider the, the only bummer about my job is Brad's. I don't get to see Brad, and if I was to turn around and watch him, the crowd would think I was being rude because y'all get tired of looking at my ass and my, my, my new fan found bald spots, but uh, so uh, so I have I face y'all, but uh, but I would love to watch Brad because Brad's fun to watch because he's really entertaining back there. <laughs> uh, I don't want to rush anybody, but just before we have to end, I, I just want to thank everybody in this crowd for being here and for all of you folks for coming and speaking with us. Supporting independent bookstores and local venues is so important for the character of our community, and because you're here, we're here. Um, without supporting brick and mortar bookstores, we can't have flesh and blood talent. So uh, I really want to thank all of you guys for being here. And just the, the amazing uh, character it takes to be on the road for so long and to make it work, make it happen. I think I speak for all of us when I say thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.
but uh, we we recorded uh, we recorded uh, Ballad of Cecil Cobb, a song by Wes. We recorded a Wes Freed song, okay. and I played banjo. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's cool. So I'm trying to get my band to fix. So maybe before, before homecoming and after. Well, we're excited to see you tonight, guys. Thank you so very much. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for both. Yeah, absolutely. Thank God for being here. Yeah, they've got one college. <laughs> 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 Ronnie, dry stop.